I hope that your first session was rich and fulfilling. It was, my first session was, and, and I'm excited and blessed to be with these very special people. Um, I'm not going to really do a whole introduction of their backgrounds. They'll share their, their, their stories with us, but it's a privilege. Commissioner Chenwa Li and Ferengis Senegatpour from well, let's see, Chinua, you're from, you're local. Uh, Bayside, sort of local. Bayside. Bayside. Ferengis Senegatpour lives here in Great Neck. And Mufti Farhan lives in Bethpage. Bethpage. So it's this actually a really special panel because we're all here. And that's really been a very important part of the focus to, we have such an incredibly rich, diverse community in Great Neck that, you know, can we imagine a world 10 years down the road or three or you know, where in which the bonds of connection really are stronger and richer. So, I'd like to ask Mufti Farhan to open. Sure. Good afternoon, greeting and blessings to all. Thank you for being here. Uh, I truly feel honored and humbled to be invited uh, and being uh, in the presence of all of you. Uh, I want to begin off by sharing a story from the, the Quran, the holy book related to forgiveness. I shared another incident in the, in the previous session, but I want to share another story uh, of how it relates to forgiveness. And forgiveness is something that we come across every single moment of our life. To an extent that we come out of our houses, we begin to drive, and even the road rage that's happening and taking lives of thousands of individuals. And so many people losing their, their, their calm, and so many people losing their own selves by sure things which happen to their lives. So I want to share with you an incident that we can all relate to and then relating to how forgiveness and not forgiving can also impact not only ourselves but our generations and even our kids. And when I speak in, our, in my congregation, I always say this, that our kids, our youth, our children, they observe us more than they listen to us. Right. We can tell them all we want, but what they observe in our lives are more than what they can listen to us. So they're observing our actions and the way that we deal with others is a huge impact that we have in our kids' life. I'm going to share with you a quick incident from the Quran, um, which is the holy book in Islam, which has 114 chapters. Uh, from the 48th chapter, I want to mention to you, uh, which is a chapter of victory, that uh, just give you a brief, quick uh, summary of the history in order to uh, explain this incident. According to Islamic traditions, Prophet Muhammad, he was uh, raised in Mecca. He lived there for approximately 40 years of his life. When he was given prophethood, he tried getting his people to come towards the religion, but they did not accept. After 13 years of persecutions, difficulties, hardships, and whatever he went through, he was made to leave the place that he loved the most, the place that he loved dearly, a place that he was connected to so much that prior to even leaving the area, he said, I love you, if it was not for the people, I would have never left you. So when he actually left this particular place, he had an opportunity after many years, as the history says, it was approximately eight years, that he was given this chance and opportunity to go back to the place where he was taken out from, but he was not victorious. It was a time that he would go back to Mecca, not as a person who was persecuted, but an individual who was already victorious. So the scripture has mentioned and the holy book itself mentions that when he entered inside the place where he was actually taken out from, he entered in the most humility and the most humble way that he could. Thanking God for all that he had given him, nothing upon himself. And when he came into uh, the premises of the holy, uh, the, the place, the Mecca itself, he gathered all of the people of Mecca. And for those who had persecuted him, those who have given him so much hardships, he said that I will tell you the same thing that Prophet Yusuf, which is Joseph, which is amongst one of the prophets according to Islamic traditions, he said, I will share with you the same thing that the previous prophet mentioned to their loved ones and for those who love them the most and then hurt them. And sometimes when you get pains from those that you love the most, it just hurts a little bit more than others. So he said that I will forgive you just as he had forgiven his brothers as well. And with having the capacity, the capability and strength, and this is something which matters the most. Sometimes a person says, you know, I forgive. But when you have the capacity, when you have the strength, when you have the ability 
to take the revenge and you still don't, that's what makes an individual very great. And forgiveness is something which is so special. And, and something which is so special. I was saying this in the previous session, I want to share this again. The way that we speak, the way that we relate, and the way that we even just you know, open our mouth has such an impact. Because our words, be of forgiveness, have such a power that can take an individual from the slums of life to the climax of their lives. Just the way that we use the words of forgiveness, the way that we approach an individual. I shared this in the last session I want to share with you because uh, many of you are all sitting here as new. There was a speech given by a man known as Muhammad Qahtani in 2015 on a Toastmaster speech contest. Every year Toastmaster which speaks, uh, teaches public speaking, they hold a, a speech contest, a debate uh, for people and speakers to come in and speak. So a man who spoke, his name was Muhammad Qahtani. He was an individual who talked about the power of words. And in his story of eight minutes, he talked about two things. And I want to share that with you quickly. Of how words have power. How our forgiveness of others can change and impact their lives forever. So he said, one day, I came inside my house, and my son was drawing on the wall with crayons. He was a four-year-old, and I also have a four-year-old. So he was drawing on the wall with a crayon, I came to him, and I yelled at him, I screamed at him. I said, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing this. He says, he never listened to me. He says, the next day I walked inside, he was staring at me, and he's doing it now. Meaning like, what are you going to do about it? So he was not even intimidated anymore, meaning he did not want it to change. So he says, the third day I learned my lesson. He said, I came inside this room, I got on my knees, and I came face level with him, meaning I'm not intimidating him anymore. So I'm sitting, you know, face to face with him. And I, show, I hold his shoulders, and I said, you're a big boy now. And big kids are not supposed to do this. He says that one statement never allowed him to do that again. Words have power. Words can change the life of others. He mentioned a quick story about his friend. He said, I had a friend who always tried his best to do something for others, but no one appreciated it. He said he always tried to please his parents by doing something, but they never were happy with him. So all of the life that he tried to do something, no one appreciated him. So he said when he got to a university, he called up his father, Dad, I, I, you know, I got to this college. Hey, yeah, okay, we don't have time. Yes, that's fine. You did it. That's good for you. He says life continued. When he graduated, he hit a good job. He called his dad. And he says, Dad, I have a good news. I hit a job for all the life that you worked so hard. Now I have made it. And the father's one word that I don't have time now. I'm busy. He said that one word changed his entire life. That same young kid who had reached the climax of his life went into drugs, abuse, and also died in this particular condition because words have power. Words can change the lives of others. I said this in a previous session as well. The tongue that we have been given is very precious. I tell my youth a lot of times, I say we have 32 locks for how precious it is. The 32 teeth that we have, there are the locks for our tongue because it is so precious. Because your words can change the life of others. So how important forgiveness is? And what impacts and what lessons do we give our children? What lessons do we give our kids and our progenies? And this is what they will take from them. So I want to uh, you know, further go towards our speakers and I would request them to share their stories and then I will try to get some more questions from them so that we can all relate to them. So I want to turn towards our speakers so they can also share some of their practical stories with us. This is good. This is good. <laughs> sure. This is good. Okay. My name is Farangis, and I didn't use this name um, until a few years ago when I started bringing together all aspects of my life uh, and owning it. I was 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, when the Iranian Revolution happened. And during the Iranian Revolution, I, uh, being that I went to a Muslim school, and being that I was uh, friends with, uh, we were very friendly, and uh, with the teachers, the, the principals, 
And um, once the revolution happened, I remember vividly standing in a room, uh, maybe fourth or fifth floor, um, there was a courtyard, and in this courtyard, uh, hundreds, maybe six, seven hundred students with principals, with teachers, whom I looked up to, whom I trusted, uh, chanted uh, in one voice, death to America, death to Israel, death to America, death to Israel. And that became a personal, um, uh, it was very personal to me, and it was very personal to a few others who were also experiencing this. I have to say this is not only my journey. It's a journey of many thousands of Iranian Jews who went through the revolution uh, as well. Um, but I have chosen to speak about it. Uh, I had to leave Iran um, without my parents. I went to London with my, uh, living with my grandparents and uncles, reunited after three, four years. However, my uh, hardship did not end there. Even though I went to a Jewish school in London, they thought I'm an alien because they, we were one of the first Iranians to leave uh, Iran and they had no idea what to do with a bunch of girls who know no English, uh, who have dark hair and have a terrible accent. Uh, the kids all thought that uh, we are nomads, that we have no home, we don't know what uh, TV is, movies, uh, they, they thought we are nomads and live in a desert and travel with camels. And uh, so they had to be, in a way, little by little educated. Um, and then years later, having come here with the, um, with the hostages, it wasn't a good thing to be Iranian. So I, in myself, within myself, I became dissected. I did not uh, want to be Iranian. I was fearful of being Jewish, even in America. And I made many decisions based on that fear and based on the fact that it was not a good thing to be Iranian. I didn't own it. I dismissed a lot of things. I choose to forget my language, uh, to write and read in it. Um, I, I was very hateful of the country that I came from. Uh, even though I'm a traditional person, I chose to um, not embrace a lot of them. Um, and it created a discord within myself. And it wasn't up to about four or five years ago that I learned that within our Jewish teaching, there is a word for uh, forgiveness that comes from circle. Mechila is mochol, comes from the word circle. Forgiveness is to be whole, to be in a circle, for all of your life to be in a circle. And I realized that if I don't embrace all of my life, everything that I have been, even though I hate it, even though I hate that part of my life. But if, if I don't bring forgiveness to the Iranian revolution, if I don't bring forgiveness to the country that I came from, to my DNA that has been there for two, almost over 2,000 years, my ancestry is from 2,000 years in the Iranian land. And my, my whole DNA is is bound to the dirt of that land. And I realized if I don't embrace that, if I don't forgive that, I, there is no way I can be whole, number one. And number two, because there is a break in, in myself, because there is a break in this circle, there is no way that I, as a human being, as a person who has been given life and soul on this earth, 
I can fulfill my mission and my purpose as who I am. I cannot walk as a dissected self, hating this part of me, hating that part of me, hating uh, the part of the Iranian uh, revolution, hating my heritage where I came from. I can't do that. I have to forgive and I have to embrace. And that brings wholeness to myself, but not only that, it's greater than that. It brings, um, it allows me to fulfill the, the purpose for which I'm here in, uh, in wholeness. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll request the commissioner to also share his story with us. Okay, sure. Hello everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon. Nice to see you here. It's my pleasure, pleasure to be here to meet with us, uh, meet with you know, all of us here. Mm -hmm. Not only to have ideas changed, but also have the value system circulating around and passing down tonight to our family members and tomorrow to our children, our grandchildren. Because as the uh, faculty of the university for teaching back in 2000, uh, 1993 till now, I realized that it's been changed so much. The value system among this young generation changed so much. It's so different from people 10 years younger than me, 20 years younger than me, it's so different. And look at the, the, the world, and the, the, it's such a chaotic thing going on over here. So what happens? People always ask me about what happened retaliation, hatred, you beat me once, let me beat you twice, and all kinds of things happening over here. All right, that's something we need to have a closer look at it. And the, it's utterly most important thing for us to learn the art, the art of forgiveness. Forgiveness is more of a cliche or not. No, it's, it's a cliche, it's a rule everyone of you should follow. Doesn't matter if you are Jewish, Latino, Chinese like me, so on and so forth. Together, we behold our religion, if there any, whatever. But the, the merits, the, the good deeds, deeply buried in our heart. Uh, I come from Taiwan with a Spanish language and literature bachelor degree in Taiwan. Four years in college. Most of the professors were, were priests, Mother Mercy Church and the, and the sisters from Spain and the Guadalajara, Mexico. So, we learned a lot of Spanish, but also we learned what is called love. They treat us like their babies. Fathers dedicating their life in China and Taiwan, Father, mother dedicated life in the Philippines and then to Taiwan, so on and so forth on that. They never taught us about Jesus Christ. They never taught us about uh, Ave Maria. However, the love penetrates. We can deeply feel it. To this day, I'm still missing my professors from many years ago, certain went back to Spain to retire, they sent me probably already passed along to another world. That's the first impact on me for a different culture and the foreigner using different culture for my major. I came to USA and the, uh, to St. John's University, which you know is a Catholic university on that. Why? Because that's the only university I ever applied American universities. Unlike most of my fellow friends in Taiwan, they applied quite a few universities to choose from. I only chose St. John's. Why? Because all my, my teachers, professors, told me that's a very good university. They teach by heart. Go over there, you can never be wrong. So I came to St. John's for my master's degree and BA program and forgot to go back home till now. To this day, I'm still here on that reason why. However, at St. John's, I worked daytime as an IT professional, and evening, wearing another hat as adjunct professor teaching in graduate school MBA program, even without the doctorate degree. The chairperson and the dean decided to make exception for me to teach without a doctorate degree on that. I did all my best above and beyond all that. And also, working during the day as an IT person, evening as a faculty member in graduate school over here, I interact with the Jewish uh, professors, uh, faculty members, the chairperson, and uh, Latino students, 
and the uh, and the and the and the all kinds of uh, American black and white, uh, uh, Chinese, Korean, and all over the place on that. I didn't feel any difference until 9/11 came out. Outside my window, usually I can see two beautiful towers glittering. Manhattan. That day, the towers were gone. For the whole week, as I remember vividly, the whole Manhattan was covered in dark, darkest cloud I have ever seen in my life on that. The day 9-11 happened, a student came to my office begging me to ask me to call their fellow friends in, in New Jersey, asking to call dad and mom in Long Island not to come to pick up them up because Long Island, LIE cut off, or MBI, German Shepherd, all over the place, helicopter all over the place on that. So, so the, the, the constraint in on campus on that. I made an exception to make them make a phone call, use my bathroom, so on and so forth, and then, which is supposed to be very private on that as a manager in IT. However, days after I came back, I read news about certain uh, Muslim population were being attacked, purposely or not. Long Island, Queens, uh, uh, Jersey, over the place. So the moment I went back to work, I called all my fellows full-time, part-timer, almost a 40, 50 on that. I say, now I want to tell you this strategy happened outside my window. You all know that. Today is our first day back. I just want to tell you we're all equal. Doesn't matter black and white. We transcend all ethnic background, religion for things like that. Whatever happened over here, we had to find, find what's next thing. But we're all equal. Tom you, you, uh, and Mr. Mir, you work together as good buddies. It's not because Mir is the Hakim Mir it is Afghanistan, so, so you have to do something bad about things like that. And also, I, I tell them, if you ever being attacked verbally or physically by anything, by anyone, purposely or not, please tell me. I, as, as a manager, it's my, my sole responsibility to protect you because I realize that all men are equal. Doesn't matter what kind of background, what kind of religion, or the sex orientation, whatever things, so on and so forth, like that. Next thing, I just want to share with you on that Buddhist teaching saying that when we come into trouble, there are three, different, three ways, three steps to go. Face it, resolve it, and forget about it. Let bygones be bygones, so to speak, on that. Luckily, so far, I don't have any personal experience about the, the tragedy we heard of from quite a few panels over here. However, I do want to share with you on that. Ever since I was a little boy, my parents came from China. They suffered so much about the torturing, killing, massive killing of Japanese soldiers in, in northern China on that. My mom was an 18-year-old young girl, started working on site, and with a, quite a few siblings, or four or five little toddlers or a thing on that. My mom always telling me the story. I didn't understand until I grew up. I fully understand what she meant. She resented, she hated Japanese so much. Anything Japanese for, for her and for my father, also from mainland China. They, they thought Japanese, what they call Japanese devils, Japanese monkeys, Japanese anything they can talk about for things. However, my mom was walking on the street with her siblings. Suddenly, she heard something running on her back. She turned around, guess what? Two Japanese soldiers carrying long rifles, patrolling the street, decided to chase after my mom in broad daylight. You know what's happening next. My mom couldn't wait, running marathon on that, carrying the little potatoes, because she's an adult, she can run faster. The little potatoes are falling behind. She carried, carried all of them, managed all the way to hide in the alley. You know, put it to different homes, uh, after that to open door, hiding in a stove, a backyard, all kinds of trees, whatever thing, to hide away. So Japanese soldiers couldn't find anything left. How many had it happened to my mom? Quite a few times. Luckily, she survived. However, for me, that's, that's my, not my personal experience, but the value system passed on from my parents to me. Japanese devil, Japanese monkeys, we don't use Japanese uh, TV. We, we buy things made in Taiwan. We, we, we made in Korea or things like that. On and on, ever since I came to America, I got an opportunity to interact with different ethnic backgrounds and things. Even though very few Japanese can be found in New York, especially New York City, for, for things like that. I figure it's not their fault. It's generations ago. The Japanese military, <coughs> they want to do bad things to neighboring countries. But should I, why should I hate the Japanese people walking on the street? 
why should you resent the Japanese product on that? Sometimes, oftentimes, TV or even thing, they're very good on that. So it's kind of alleviation for me on that. Also, toward the end, make a long story short, I just wanted to share one important thing, a, a true story with you on this. Everyone know about Pearl Harbor attack, right? There was a movie, a uh, joint venture between Hollywood and Japan called Tora, 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 Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. If you're of my generation, it's, you know, Tora, Tora, Tora. That's a very famous movie on it. What's the Tora, Tora, Tora? Japanese got a sudden attack on Pearl Harbor and the lead pilot sending signals to the headquarters in the air, uh, aircraft carrier sent back to Japan, sent back to the emperor saying that we made it. We attacked the American, <clears throat> American battleships, Arizona, so on so forth on that. Yeah, okay. So the lead pilot survived himself till the end of the war. And then there was an, an American cor corporal who was dropping bombs in Japan. He hated Japs so, so much on that. They met each other after World War II and decided to handshake And the pilot, the lead pilot, is this Japanese pilot. He's, he sent Tora, Tora, Tora and decided to, 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 to attack further on Americans down, down below. However, two people from the opposite side can wave their hatred in between and live in harmony and become Christian to, to baptize all over the place in each other's country. And this is a story still remains up now, resonating today. Does it mean something to us? Forgive and forget. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I, I hope that uh, all of you, hopefully we get inspired by the stories that we have heard, some of the traditions from the Holy Scripts and uh, listening to practical incidents and stories, and especially for those, uh, you know, some of the people who are present who are immigrants and who have come in and they have brought back with them, you know, feelings. Uh, the question arises now is that are we leaving these feelings to our generations or are we trying to resolve the situations? Because as we know that it's being a melting pot that we have our kids growing up in an environment, uh, do we get these feelings along towards them or do we try to instill inside of them a place of harmony and love and forgiveness within their own lives, you know, because that's the big question. Because I, 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 you know, being a, a child from parents who have migrated as well, uh, you know, we used to hear this a lot, but now having my own three kids, four, two, and one, and raising them in an environment and seeing that what values do we need to instill in our own kids? Because that's something very important. And the way that we speak, as I mentioned this in the beginning, that the observation of our kids are so much, right? When we see a particular individual of certain faith, certain color, certain language, maybe they don't look the way that, you know, maybe we look in our houses, what sort of feeling do we leave behind for our kids? You know, this is something that I always, you know, look into my own life. When I'm traveling with my kids and now because they are so young and being four and two, they are, you know, they observe every little thing and they ask every little thing. And when they are walking with me, they are driving, they are sitting in their car seats, and when they look at certain things, or when sometimes me and my wife, we are speaking, we have to be more careful and more conscious of how we even relate and speak about an individual. Because these are the feelings that these kids are taking back with them. And I would actually wanna go back to some questions uh, with our panelists and ask them that the feelings that they had brought back with them, or the, the feelings that they grew up in, and, and both of our panelists actually were in the midst of these feelings. How do you relate to your children? Meaning, if, the, if you do get into conversation with your kids, you know, what sort of feeling do you give them? Or how hard it is for you to give them the entire scenario, but not let them feel against someone or, or still have the feeling of forgiveness inside of them? Because many of us may not have the same situations, but we do go through situations in which we have to think. Is it accountability or is it forgiveness? Do I hold them accountable or do I just forgive them, right? As in my last session, I was saying that according to the Islamic traditions, and I was actually one of the, the persons who was in, in last session, he came to me, he said, in our Jewish tradition, we have something very similar. So I said, I learned something new, is that prior to going to sleep, you actually audit yourself. You look at yourself. That from the beginning of my day till the day that I'm going to bed, how much good have I done for others? How many smiles have I brought on the faces of others? 
or how much wrong did I do to others which I was not supposed to do? Any person who runs the corporate world or have their own businesses, you cannot manage or run until you don't out order yourself at the time of closing, right? What's the profit? What's the loss? What am I supposed to do? So I, I actually say this to my congregation a lot, that prior to sleeping every night, we should all think about it. From the time that I woke up to the time that I'm going to sleep, how much goodness have I left in the eyes of others? How many moments were there that I should have forgiven I did not? How much time could I have held back but I did not? So I just want to get this question back to our panelists quickly, uh, and I would like both of you to say a few words is that being in the situation of, of, of being a part of the, the difficulty yourself and being practically young and facing these difficulties, now raising children in an environment when we don't have difficulties, and how do you cope with that and what do you teach your children? So my, thank you. So uh, first of all, forgiveness is a process. It's not something that comes about oops, one day I need to forgive and therefore I have forgiven. It's a process. And once you're over the process, once you've gone over the, the hill, hill, if you would, it becomes not about the story anymore. It becomes about transcending the story. And so when we are relating to our kids, and by the way, there was a, a scientific uh, data on this that we pass on our emotions to our kids genetically. Forget about the words that we use and the actions that we have in our home. Uh, we pass it along genetically. And so for me, in the past few years, uh, this question, of how do I transcend my own story? How do I transcend and, and really not be defined by it? I certainly do not be, want to be defined by certain things that happened to my life. I don't want to make decisions based on those things. I don't want to be, uh, my definition of, of Ferengis be defined as the events that happened in my life. And so transcending the, the story and therefore what I pass on to my children now is embracing uh, the traditions, the, uh, the Iranian traditions. And in the past year, actually, I have talked a lot about wanting to go back to Iran and wanting, where, whereas before I said, I never want to go back, I never want to visit. And so wanting to go back, wanting to go actually visit the streets. And I have, my, my kids are older, they're 26, 24, and 15. And recently they have been saying the same thing, that, you know, when you do go back, I'd love to go back with you. Um, I'd love to see the streets where you grow up. I don't know if it's there now, or I'd love to see what has happened to it. Um, and, you know, embracing that and for my children to embrace that and not to deny it, not to deny themselves of the tradition, of the beautiful tradition that they too are a part of, and rather to embrace it, but also embrace everything that they have, they are about now, today, um, and everything that their parents brought with them uh, in here. And I, I think that's so important. And uh, if I may, uh, with the permission of the rabbi, uh, this moment is uh, uh, an awesome moment for myself. And I, I related um, uh, to uh, Master Farhan. Um, and the reason is that uh, since I left Iran, uh, I have really never sat in a conversation uh, with a Muslim. And so for me, this is profound. And it is taught to us that in order for forgiveness to be complete, we need to be panim panim, face to face. We need to have our faces towards each other. And to be face to face means also that I get connected to your divine self and you get 
connected to mind divine self rather than the physical self. We get connected to our divinity. So, Thank you so much. I connect to your divinity, if Thank I so may. Thank you so much. And um, I embrace everything that your religion uh, teaches and I embrace this, that this connection that has taken place uh, about uh, 35, 36 years after I have left Iran. And I thank you for this experience. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go to Professor Lee now uh, to uh, mention something related to thank how you. you go through your children and, and relating this. Thank you. I impress my mind myself. I never pass along my parents' hatred of the Japanese. Apparently, they have their reasons. I never pass along to my, my daughter. She was born, born in America. We're fulfilling our American dream. I don't want anything bad happening to her on that. And also I realized that, as you said, being parents, we're teaching our children by example. They listen to what we said, they listen to what we do for things like that. So it's very important, critically important for us to watch ourselves first, making sure we made the right model for them to follow for things. And also, besides teaching at St. John's University, also I've been moonlighting, wearing many hats, teaching Virgin Marine Academy by Greenneck and the SUNY Maritime College by Throbneck uh, Bridge uh, for Skyla and also a uh, CUNY system. However, after Iraqi war, uh, budget cuts from federal all the way down, they could not hire outside professor to teach, so I continue to teach on St. John's. What would you do if you believe, that's my firm belief, teaching is a business of conscience. Your parents pay you money, come here to receive education from me, it's simply because you're crying, I give you a second chance. How about Tom? Tom never came to me to tell about his personal problem. Should I treat Tom as the policy and make exception to you, to you, whatever thing is on that? What would you do? You, you do above and beyond for teaching and then later on, only to realize students give you very bad evaluation. Nowadays, even over the internet, over the internet, Professor Lee is a tough, too tough. Uh, he, he purposely make it tough for things. <laughs> However, I told my students, please, ladies and gentlemen, teaching is business questions. I know where you're coming from. I know where you go. The job market is getting harder and harder on that. Years ago, when I came to America, I graduated. Unless I didn't want to work, I got a job. How about you now? You had to sharpen your, your head, may not even get, the, and, and get a job. Or even part-timer, no benefits. And so on and so forth. So after so many years, it doesn't matter if a student gave me good evaluation, bad evaluation, or person in front of me and then the, and the step on my back, whatever. I decided to forgive. As a faculty, what else can I do? I for, they're children. They're children. I told them, I, I'd rather you hate me today before you graduate. Don't hate me years after, everlasting forever. Because by then, you know, I, I'm heartily telling you, you can learn something from my class and so forth, especially computer and business all together, which is a very good combo over here. And the last thing I just want to tell you on that, it's easier to say than done. We talk about forgive, we talk about love, we, talk, we remember the song many years ago, now the world needs love, the love, sweet love. Is that right? Many years ago, during Vietnam War. Vietnam War came out when I was in elementary school. American helicopter flying over our skies. By my high school, American airplanes destroyed airplane tanks, dented, all came back to Taiwan to junkyard to repair, to reuse, recycle for things like that. When it was college, Saigon, American embassy, helicopter left. Things happen so fast. There, there's enough trouble already for our world. How to make sure your children our, our children, our great-grandchildren can have a peaceful life. There's something we can do it now. Not just by saying, not lip service. Let's do it now, pass along to our younger generations on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So just to wrap up uh, our, our panel and this discussion itself, 
just to mention, I hope this um, breakout session was insightful for many. I, I hope that uh, many of you will get inspired by some of the personal stories which were shared. Uh, many of us go through these things, uh, you know, on daily basis. You know, sometimes the level of, of situations that we go through might not be to this level. But I guess when we go through and we try to see situations so difficult, sometimes our situations become very less. And then we can learn how to forgive. Because when you see the difficulty of someone who has gone through much more difficulty than ours, then we, I, I guess it's much more easier for us. And I was saying this uh, in, the, in the previous session as well, that from amongst the traditions of, of the Holy Prophet in Islam, he said that a sabru in the sadmatil ula. The word sabr means patience and forgiveness. It is at the moment of the impact of difficulty. Sometimes the wounds can heal and sometimes they don't. But the moment of the impact of difficulty, gathering enough courage to forgive thinking beyond the situations that we are going through and, 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 and gathering all the energy that we can to forgive others is something that we can all take back, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes it might be feelings that we had for years. It might be situations that have, might have occurred recently or situations that we may go through every day of our life holding on to forgiveness, holding on to the aspect of, of spirituality. And I said this as well before in the session that that there's a verse in Quran which inspires me a lot. And, that's, uh, and, and the verse itself is from chapter 24, uh, which is the chapter of light, verse 22. It said that those who wish to be forgiven by their Lord should always remember to forgive others. And I always remember that, you know what, I, I'm an individual, I'm a human being, and I may or I may make a mistake. But I'm always hopeful for the forgiveness of my Lord because I could never be to the level that I'm supposed to be as a human being. We all make mistakes. And we all would wish to be forgiven by our Lord, but then how much do I forgive others? You know? so, so the amount of forgiveness that I would want from the Lord is the amount of forgiveness that I should give others. And that's something that we should relate to every single day, you know. Be it small, be it large, be it something which happened many years ago, be it something which is very recent, but I think the things that should inspire us a lot in forgiveness is hoping for the forgiveness of our Lord, which is not only beneficial as for many they believe in the hereafter, but also beneficial in this world. The forgiveness of the Lord is beneficial for us in this world as well. So I, so I hope that this, this session itself will give us enough inspiration, enough insight uh, within ourselves to go back and of course learn a lot about other faiths, get to interact about other faiths as well, but also to take back forgiveness in our lives uh, and to take away, as they say, the old wounds and try to heal them slowly, as they said, uh, as our beautiful panelists mentioned to us in such beautiful words, which definitely touched and inspired my hearts, that maybe it will take a little long, but the journey has to begin today. That we have to begin the journey of forgiveness, and we hope that all of you have benefited from this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enormous thank you to the three of you. It's a privilege for each of us to be in your, in your midst. We go now, the main panel discussion will begin at 4.15, this clock is an hour fast, if you didn't notice. 4.15, down in the main sanctuary, below. Thank you. Thank you.